Hello and a warm welcome to all of you. Today we have a very deep and exciting talk on the topic, the concept of karma and reincarnation. The law of karma has always been in existence. And while many have an inkling about it, scarcely a few grasp the truth and full meaning as it is the way it is. Only a handful understand how to best use this law to their full advantage. We are today going to see this law from a myriad of angles. We shall also hear how the law of karma and reincarnation interface. Sister Janice, our speaker, is an experienced practitioner of Raj Yoga meditation for over 45 years with the Brahma Kumaris. She has spent the last four decades traveling the globe, sharing spiritual wisdom to audiences all over the world. Sister Denise will provide you with some understanding of this deep law and offer some spiritual tools. It is our sincere hope that you derive maximum benefit from the gems shared during today's session. Let us all welcome Sister Denise joining us from France today. Good morning, Sister Denise. Good morning, and I am delighted to be with you, Jabin, and everyone from Indonesia. And I'm also aware that um, because of technology, we're able to be quite a large group of people from all over the world. And um, Normally I'm in Germany, but at the moment France, so you can see the um, very traditional 18th century house that I'm in at the moment. So um, let me just make sure that all these extra sounds are off. <laughs> so karma and reincarnation, the philosophy, the details, the practicalities, how we use this, how we understand it. I think the first thing we need to be aware of is that it is not as straightforward as people generally think and as most people make out. So what I'd like to do is take it from a very simple basic level and then as we go further we can see some of the subtleties involved because when we want to really understand it and apply it in our lives and interpret what's going on in our lives we need to see the maybe less obvious more hidden factors and if we don't take them into consideration well we are not able to use the information effectively and accurately so everyone knows this expression what goes around comes around it's very um straightforward everybody has heard about it it's often used but then how do we understand it then there's another expression which you find in the christian bible as you sow so shall you reap and this is how people generally understand the law of karma is that whatever you do you will get the equal and opposite return. And this is also positioned in a little bit of a scientific uh, way. And so people understand it in that way, but they understand it, I think, in quite a limited way. And consequently, because of not taking everything into consideration, um, people get confused or don't get it quite right. So I'd like to just put it in a very realistic and clear way. 
Uh, first of all, um, let's go into the actual description and definition of karma and also then see how it works with the idea of reincarnation. Um, I think if somebody is in a culture like Buddhism and Hinduism, which assumes reincarnation, then that's already part of a person's thinking. And you grow up with that awareness. But um, I think at least half the world is um, of another culture which doesn't subscribe to the idea of reincarnation. Certainly the Abrahamic religions on the whole do not. And in the practice of Raj Yoga, which I do, uh, definitely the idea of karma and reincarnation are intimately connected. Karma is on three levels your thoughts, your words, and your actions. So what you think is an act of mind. What you say and what you write is a, a, a verbal act. And then the physical things that you do, these are also um, physical actions. Also, what people don't realize is that when someone does something to you, the way you take it, the way you interpret it, that is also karma. So someone may do something quite uh, neutral and you take it badly, then it complicates the matter. And because you took it badly, you added an energy of negative karma to something quite neutral. Another way you can look at it is someone does something quite negative to you, quite damaging, but yet because of your spiritual knowledge and wisdom and your personal power, you take it in your stride, you take it quite neutrally, you are not perturbed by it, you adjust, you flex, and then the negative charge on that karma uh, doesn't impact you at all, but the way that you have interpreted it constitutes a positive karmic charge for you, and it actually reduces the negative impact of that negative intention of the other person on their karma. So you can see that it's really quite subtle and quite complex. And, um, you know, unless we're really analyzing it, we don't very often think about these subtleties, but in, um, our discussion today, I, th I think it's really very useful to do that. Um, karma has an immediate impact, a midterm impact and a long term impact. So, for example, you say something and it's quite hurtful, but you didn't intend it to be, but there'll be an immediate effect on the atmosphere and you will intuitively feel that you did some harm, but you didn't mean to, but it's too late because it already came out of your mouth. So there is a charge on that, which can dissipate quite quickly, or it can persist depending on how the participants respond to it or react to it or are impacted by it. Sometimes people say, um, why is it that um, bad things happen to good people or um, bad people get away with what they do and they don't get brought to book and it should, shouldn't be like that. And this is because um, the consequences of karma are inevitable 
but the time frame is not determined by the people involved. Uh, the laws of karma have their own, you can say, machinery. And then you begin to see that the laws of karma are connected with a much wider picture, which includes the length of time of reincarnation, which is very, very long time frame. And also there is another factor which is destiny. And there you begin to be aware that there's a paradox involved. So whenever anything is happening, you look at it from your angle and you say, okay, this is happening. And you evaluate it. This is a good action. This is a bad action or somewhere in between. But you are not aware of the aspect of destiny. So there are some actions which are done, some things that happen that are destined. And in that case, the karmic consequence will not be seen as you expect to see it. And this is because it is destined. So most people believe they have a destiny. Uh, there is such a thing as destiny, but it's very difficult to look at a particular event and say, is this because it's destined? Is somebody responsible? What will be the karmic consequences? So you can see it's quite subtle. And in order to figure out whether something is um, a karmic consequence or whether something is destined, you have to look at your intuition. Uh, take a situation which happens to many people. You're living your life normally and all of a sudden something bad happens and it's a big challenge. You have to deal with it. And very often you will say to yourself, what did I do to deserve this? It's a very common expression that many people just automatically, it just comes out of their mouth or into their mind. What did I do to deserve this? And when you get a thought like this, or you say this out loud or just to yourself, it's a sign that deep down intuitively, you picked up that this happened to you as a kind of settlement of something that you must have done maybe in another lifetime. So people who believe in the idea of reincarnation can quite easily put these ideas together and say, yes, um, I don't know what I did in another lifetime, but I must have done something. And it's quite easy for them to think that, oh yeah, I'm settling some karma, the something I did in another lifetime. And so, okay, I'll settle it. Uh, people who don't believe in reincarnation cannot um, resolve the equation. And then in that case, when you say to yourself, what did I do to deserve this? It's like a rhetorical question because uh, there's no feeling that you must have done something in another lifetime. So it's actually quite important in order to understand about the laws of karma to consider that, yes, um, 
this life is not the only one. And how you understand that better is to consider that you yourself are not your body, but you are the spirit within the body who is eternal and who is journeying through time. Of course, the physical body has a lifespan of 70, 80, 90, maybe even 100 years. Um, and then you die. So then what? What happens when a person dies? So we would not use the word death because death is something that happens to the body. And there's always some cause of death, can be an illness or an accident. Occasionally, it will be said someone died from old age, they just couldn't carry on any longer, fell apart, but the spirit carries on. And so it is said in the philosophy of karma, that you will take birth into a family, into a culture, into a circumstance, into a body, whether masculine or feminine, according to your karma. So this is one of the laws of karma that you will take birth according to your karma. So what that means is everyone listening is in a body and you have parents and brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandparents, you live somewhere in a culture, in a society, you may be in a family which is wealthy or poor, you may have a good a healthy constitution, or you may have weak health, you may have certain congenital uh, weaknesses which come up in your um, life. Uh, maybe you are likely to get heart problems or someone else is likely to get other organ problems. Uh, someone else is very fit, even if they don't look after themselves particularly. All this is connected with karma. So people want to understand themselves. People want to understand why am I in the situation that I'm in? And you can look at your situation and circumstances from the angle of karma. And it gives you quite an interesting perspective on why your life is the way it is. And it includes subtle things like your talents, your intelligence level, uh, the way you learn, whether you're a shy person or an outgoing person. Some of this is connected with your previous karma. Some of it is destiny. And some of it is environmental. And the most of the psychological disciplines talk about your personality being a result of your social environment. And they don't look at karma or reincarnation because it's not part of the um, thinking in um, the scientific world. But from the angle of spirituality, we'd have to take into consideration the destiny, the karma, and the social environment. So you can see that when you want to analyze it quite deeply, you can't just jump to conclusions very quickly. You have to think, and more than anything, you have to feel. And that feeling is an intuitive capacity. You have to feel with your mind. You have to have like a sense 
that um, is this happening because of karma? Is it happening because of the social environment? Or is it just destiny? So that means that the way we interpret what's happening is up to us, but how we choose to interpret it needs to include some sort of a sensitivity, an intuitive sense. Is this karma? Is this social environment? Is this destiny? And a person who studies these things and is interested and meditates and all that, you start to build up quite a good capacity for interpreting what's happening to you in a very reasonable, realistic way. And this is actually quite good. You may have people around you who will jump to conclusions and something bad happens to you and they will all say, oh, well, this is your bad karma. Maybe, maybe not, you know. And so do not listen to people who just quickly give you an evaluation because they may not be taking into consideration all the elements. And so this knowledge of karma and reincarnation really does invite us to take responsibility for the interpretation and not to allow other people's evaluation to influence us. This is really quite important. So coming back to uh, karma, as you sow, so you reap. Short-term, mid-term, long-term. Your current situation is because of previous karma, but also because of destiny and um, the social environmental considerations start to play once you have already taken birth. Now, in spiritual practice, we need to think about ourselves as masters of our own lives. Um, a lot of times people need to really work on this because there are so many things that are not in your control, so many things which are, um, you know, strong influences. And it's very easy to give away your power and just think that those influences are more powerful than they really are. So spiritual practice tells us First of all, think about yourself as the master of your own life. And you are the one who has the right and the authority to interpret what's happening to you. And also remember that no one knows you as well as you know yourself even people who are really close to you. And very often people say, oh, I know you better than you know yourself. No, that is just their way of trying to influence you, trying to get power over you. And so the knowledge of karma and reincarnation also warns us, do not give away your power, do not do actions under the influence of other people because you will have to pay for those things that you have done, even if it was someone else who was, you know, you can say making you do this. And this becomes an issue 
when people are in situations and circumstances where they are told you have to do this or you cannot do that or you have to go here or you cannot go here so it's very important to um, meditate because when you meditate you are intensifying your personal power you are coming into your personal power and you start to be much more aware that you are responsible for everything you do and if you do something because somebody forced you to do it you have to see to what extent you can assert your own personal authority. In many cases, you cannot, particularly in the case of a child. A child is not financially autonomous, um, don't have very much life experience, and they may have a very authoritarian um, figures around them in the adult world who oblige them to behave in a certain way. And so the child who is not in their own uh, age of majority and so on, cannot be held accountable to the same extent as someone who is an adult and is in their own power. And in fact, the more you bring yourself into your own power and become your own master, the more you are um, going to be held accountable for what you do and how you do it. So you can see all these nuances are there. And I'm telling you about this because we need to take them into consideration in order to understand well um, how we're running our lives and what is going to happen um, if we understand it well and interpret well. And then we can make mistakes, make a misinterpretation, and um, then we will find ourselves in a situation which is avoidable, but which we messed up and all of us do that this is very normal and what should we do when we mess things up well we have to take the consequences and we have to learn for the future <coughs> uh, every single one of us is um, imperfect all of us are trying to be a better self. This is absolutely normal. We're all trying to get it right. And it's, I think, quite important in this to not be perfectionist, to not beat ourselves up when we get it wrong and make mistakes. We have to, you know, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and take note of what happened. Um, maybe decide, okay, I won't do that again. I won't fall into that trap again. And in that way, we gather life experience and we move on. I think it's also very important to be able to let go. And in the study and practice of Raj Yoga, along with learning about karma and along with learning about reincarnation, we also learn about personal power. And there are different powers that everyone can cultivate and develop. And the power to let go and move on is really a very important one. Um, there are some cultures where people are trained to feel guilty if they do something wrong and sometimes they will carry that guilty feeling very long and in fact if you carry that guilty feeling long 
that even becomes a negative karma. So we need to know that. And feeling guilty is something that is like a message from your conscience, which says, oops, hey, that wasn't right. Or even when you're in the middle of doing something, the voice of conscience will say, no, no, don't do that. You know, stop that, stop that right now. And you can stop a negative karma right in the middle of it. That is possible if you listen to that inner voice of conscience. So when we have done something and we feel bad, we need to apply some other information, which is to do with the idea of destiny and say, okay, I did it. I admit it, it wasn't right, but it happened. I can't undo it. I can apologize. I can make amends, but I can't deny that it happened. And I pay the price and move on. We must be able to let go and move on. Otherwise, our very soul gets contaminated by holding on to that guilt. And it is a very disempowering um, emotion. And, and a lot of people do not realize that it's actually quite negative to carry on feeling guilty past the point where you got the message that, okay, that wasn't right. Um, our relationship with time is also a factor. You know, in many uh, spiritual practices, they talk about being in the now and being in the present and all of this. And, and this is also a very good suggestion because the present time is the only time where you actually have the power to decide and act. And once an act is done, there's nothing you can do about it. Some people, they spend a lot of time worrying about the past and then fretting about the future. There is some construction going on, so please excuse the sound of this, but I think you can hear me all right. Um, so the, um, the concerns about the future, we need to handle those by knowing about the laws of karma. So whatever, we, uh, whatever circumstances we are in in the present moment, these circumstances um, present us with a situation where we either have to act or we have to do nothing or we have to be a detached observer because there's nothing we can do. Or we have to um, say no when something is trying to force us to do something, say no. So all of these can happen only in the present moment. And we have to be present for the present moment because this is when we are performing the karma which will create the future. If you're worrying about the future, then you're not in the present. And then whatever possibility you have to do the appropriate karma at that present moment, you miss it. And then what you do is kind of automatic action. Automatic action, is action that you do, which is your habit. And in the practice of Raj Yoga, we have a word, which I will tell you is quite an interesting word, sanskaras. And sanskaras are your set of um, behavior patterns that are normal for you according to certain situations. So, when you're not present in the present moment, then these sanskaras take over and your decision, your evaluation of the situation and the choice to act in this way, to speak these words, to think and feel in this particular way, that is um, not available to you. 
and you are totally driven by the sanskaras. And the sanskaras lie in the subconscious. And when you are um, driven by the subconscious, that effectively means that you are driven by past negative karmic patterns, which means that your overall general situation remains the same and you are not doing what you could do to change the direction of your life or to turn your life around. So this is why it is always recommended that um, really try to be in the present so that you are taking charge and that even if you have a strong habit pattern that wants to come up and dictate how you function, but your wisdom and your internal power can neutralize that and then you do what is a really powerful, meaningful, appropriate action. And this is called coming into your power. So this is quite um, important. So I've been telling you a lot of, uh, a lot of things which are um, peripheral to the law of karma and reincarnation, but I need to do that because it is a holistic picture, a picture of the world. And um, if we just take a little bit of it and don't take it in the context of the whole, then we cannot really understand it in such a way to apply it and actually make a difference and really see the difference. So karma in the context of destiny, being aware about the power of choice, the importance of staying in the present and accepting that circumstances around you, maybe because of destiny, maybe because of negative karma, maybe because of very positive karma, because karma is sometimes thought of as only negative. No, it's neutral. It means action. But because people are spiritually quite depleted, a lot of people do a lot of negative action because you need spiritual power to do really pure, positive, uh, meaningful action which takes you forward and brings you into your fortune. So these are uh, quite important um, considerations uh, to, to bear in mind. So then you seeing yourself in uh, a kind of wider context than most people see. And there is where the consciousness of the self as a spiritual being becomes really very important because your identity, the person that you are, the person that you are who is acting, thinking, speaking, doing, the person that you are is fundamentally pure, peaceful, powerful, blissful, and um, this is you. Um, sometimes people tell people that their identity is they are sinners. And in Raj Yoga, we would say, no, that is not my identity. My identity is a pure, peaceful, powerful, loveful, blissful being of light who has made mistakes, no doubt, but that is not my identity. And whatever mistakes we have made, we'll pay for. How do you pay for mistakes? How do you pay for negative karma? 
One way is some sort of suffering that corresponds to the negative karma that you do. And a lot of people think that's the only way, but it's one of the ways. Some people may suffer through relationships. Some people may suffer through health issues. Some may suffer through financial situations. Um, and all of these are definitely connected with um, karma that you had done at some point. And so you will have to pay in kind for what you did, no doubt. But suffering is something that you can attenuate. Uh, in this, there are two things. One is pain and one is suffering. You will get some sort of pain. It could be social, financial, physical, emotional. Many different kinds of pain are there. But when you are spiritually strong and in your power, then you can handle that pain. And that means that the suffering is greatly reduced. So you are paying your karma, but because you have power, because you have a kind of uh, spiritual bank account that you can apply your power to neutralize the pain of that payment, that repayment. So then it's not a big deal. So that makes a big difference. And this is why the powers are very good. You can flex with it, you can endure, you can tolerate, you can manage, you will not um, lose your sense of self, even if all around everybody's trying this and that and the other on you, but you remain intact and in your power and you move through it and you get some extra life experience and this then is called the power to transform. So something is there, but you do not take it as it presents itself. You take it as you decide you will take it. And that means that you are always keeping yourself in your position of power and self-awareness mm -hmm. and self-assertion, and this is your self-respect. So I will close now. Um, I brought up many things and uh, I'm sure that um, you have some questions. I know Jabin will come back to me with a few points, uh, definitely. And um, then we will have some meditation. So thank you so much and Om Shanti. Thank you, sister. That was indeed an eye opener. And um, yes, you brought out a lot of um, points here. Points that I never thought of to begin with is that um, the law of karma is very simple indeed, but also very deep. It is simple by what you started with that whatever actions that you do, you will receive an equal and opposite return. But what also you mentioned that how we take, how other people perform their karma and how we take it, that also is karma. So that is definitely an eye opener. And also what you said that this is the time, the present time. So whatever we do, we can decide now. Yes, we do have a lot of questions and also a lot of comments, but I would like you to help us or guide us into a guided meditation before we start for a few minutes on how do we Meditate, like you said, meditation can help us empower ourselves or build up that power that we have within ourselves. So if you could give us a little sample of how we should practice that every day. Definitely. So first of all, um, sit comfortably. 
And take a moment to turn your attention within, to feel the self, the soul, the spirit within. And to remember the identity of the self as a spiritual being. I am a light. I am an actor. A spiritual being, pure consciousness, loving, at peace, in my power, content and happy, just because I am me. I am not this body. This is a costume that I act through in circumstances. The circumstances arise. They last for a while and then they subside. While something is there, I have to deal with it. If it's stressful, I have the power to manage it. If it creates fear, I go to my courage and I face it. If it confuses me, I remember who I am and I get through it. I am connected with the higher power. That supreme being is always with me. I turn my attention to that companion, that support that source and I take strength from that one. Beyond this material world is a world of light. I go there in my mind. And link myself to that great light that is there in that world of light. I draw power into myself. I draw light. And it restores my spirit. I am able to do whatever is needed because I have taken light, I have taken power.
and I know who I am. A being of power, loving and at peace. I flex with all things. And whatever happens, I will do what is the most beneficial, accurate, appropriate action for that moment for that situation and let go and move on. Practice this. Take time to sit quiet. Be in your power and be connected with the source of wisdom, peace, and strength. And gently let yourself return to the everyday world and back into the game of life. Play your part well. Thank you. And Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you, sister. I'll start with um, some of the comments that we have here from both Zoom and YouTube Live. We have here saying thank you, Denise Ben. Um, thank you very much. You have really touched some of the questions that I had and you've already answered them. There is one, another one which says, I see some people who had taken other people's wealth, but they still live in prosperous life. And it doesn't look that they got their karma after making other people poor. Um, the other one is that I see good people suffering and bad people are happy. Is it our last birth karma? So these two are connected. Right, exactly. Well, um, the thing is that karma has a very long arm. And there's um, a, a, an amazing statue that is in Singapore. I don't know if anyone from Singapore is online, but it's a statue, um, quite a modern one of uh, a person and the, the finger is pointing and it's going and creating a huge circle and it comes back and taps them on the back. And this is really, I think, an amazing image about karma. And you may be impoverishing someone, but they may have impoverished you and they paid back, you know, so there's that part of it. Or you may have impoverished someone and enriched yourself and uh, you will pay sooner or later. Uh, very often the consequences of karma are in a subsequent life or two or three lives further on. Uh, and so it's very difficult for people to see the law of karma in action because a lot of time the consequences are really uh, quite far away from the original cause. And this is why we learn about the mechanism of karma. Sometimes, you know, you see it right away, you eat food which is not okay and or doesn't suit you and you get sick the next day or the same day. So that's an immediate thing. But a, a lot of the time it is, um, uh, it, it comes quite a bit later. Um, you see, uh, 
we say so and so is a good person, so and so is a bad person, and that's our perspective on them. In spiritual language, we would say that everyone is fundamentally pure, peaceful, powerful, loveful, blissful being of light, and they have done karma and they have sanskaras. And so, if a person is behaving in a way that we think is not okay, there may be various other things that we need to take into consideration before we will say this is a bad person. And mostly what we also can bear in mind is that pretty much everyone who does action that we evaluate as bad is a reaction to trauma that they experienced early in life. And this particularly with people who are like really violent and things like that. It's very, very difficult to um, be really correct with our evaluation of people when we look at things um, at face value. We have to go deep and really see the heart of a person. Uh, um, th there's one film which shows this, which is called The Green Mile. It's a very wonderful film about uh, a man who was uh, accused and convicted of um, murdering two little girls and, um, and he was on death row. And as you go through the film, you gradually find out that actually it wasn't him, it was someone else and that he was really a very, very good person. And that there were some people in the film who were, you know, considered to be good people, but in the end it showed up they were actually not. And like this. So um, you will see the artists and filmmakers and writers, they are in a way charged in life with analyzing human behavior and showing us that things are not always what they seem. And they teach us to uh, look beneath the surface. And when we are evaluating people to, to not judge quickly, because very often we get it wrong or we judge on the basis of prejudice and preconception. So just to bear in mind about that. Thank you, sister. Um, there's a question in French, but I mm -hmm. am not you familiar with French. Out, uh, French. You just read it out and I'll tell um, you what. I actually sent it to you. Oh. On the chat box, yes. On the, on the chat box? Wait yes. A sec. I'll have to put my glasses on so I can see it. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, y a-t-il un lien entre les rêves et le karma Quand une personne qui fut proche apparaît régulièrement dans un rêve, comment faire le tri entre vice, luxure, compte karmique éventuel non compréhensible ou service à faire pour cette âme Doit-on creuser pour comprendre la signification du rêve Ok, this is all about a dream. And I have encountered this type of dream before uh, and different people who have been in conversation with me and I'm assuming this French speaking person is understanding me or maybe getting a translation but um, you may dream about a person in a way which is um, a romantic intense romantic dream and this may be because of your desire, or it may be because of their desire, or it may be also that you are afraid of that and in denial of a connection with that. It can also be symbolic for something very different. Um, dreams uh, are a, a deep subject, they're very connected with uh, karma and reincarnation, but dreams are very often symbolic. And you usually do not 
take the dream as something that is or was or is going to be, uh, but you need to see the symbolic value. And there are people who have studied this a great deal. And it comes up to some extent in Raj Yoga. And generally speaking, it will be said that this is telling you something about your subconscious. And in the subconscious, it may be desires that you're repressing. It may be a karmic account that's coming up. Um, and maybe you have been in a very intense relationship with someone and there's unfinished business. So it's like a warning to tell you, be careful, don't get too caught up because there are energies pulling you together with another person. And if you follow the attraction, it's another thing that I didn't mention in my talk, but um, when you have a karmic account, that's another whole subject, karmic accounts, you have unfinished business from another life with someone, you have an account, and that account has to be settled. And the way to settle the account is there is a powerful energy of attraction that brings you together with that person. And then the situation of attraction gets you very caught up and you get under the illusion that this is something very good. And then when you're fully tied into that person, the circumstance reverses. And from attraction, it becomes repulsion. And then you start to experience suffering, sorrow, distress, difficulty. And that is the settlement of the karma through the pain and suffering. And, and very often it will come to you beforehand in a dream as a warning and uh, or to let you know look this is coming up next so get ready and be in your power because you have to handle something here it's quite difficult just like that in a in a general way to say which particular situation you're talking about but um, these are real and the main thing i think as a solution or a response to a dream like that is to be neutral to be in your power and to follow the principles of uh, spiritual life. Because if you follow those principles, you will not get caught up into a bad situation that you then have to extricate yourself from. If you follow the uh, energy of attraction, then you will get pulled in and you will get into big trouble. So this is really... Um, a matter of choice, a matter of wisdom. Uh, keep yourself on your right track and um, deal with what comes along by not getting trapped. Thank you, sister. We still have a few questions. Do you have time? Sure. Yeah, yeah is that okay? A few more minutes, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you are feeling not right sometimes and into if into into intuitively a sense of something is not right are people subtly elsewhere trying to limit you suppress you and take your self-mastery away um it's possible but you always must consider yourself to be stronger than them um because if they are trying to do something to you, which is not their job, you can say, um, that's a negative energy. And when you are in your consciousness of being a spiritual being, pure, peaceful, powerful, loveful, blissful, um, assert that, intensify that. If you think that you know where it's coming from, uh, send uh, good wishes, neutral feelings, and um, no hard feelings, whatever it is, do not be afraid of it, and just move on, because it um, really doesn't matter what somebody thinks of you, it matters what you think of yourself and what you do. That's more powerful. Um, we have a question very connected to that. If someone else did something bad to me, shall I keep quiet and accept it as I am settling the past karma? 
or shall I voice it out and take action according to the norm, the rules and the law? If one keeps quiet about it, is that being silly or the other way, being wise? You have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to evaluate each situation on its own merits and you have to decide what your policy is. And uh, also what your power is. If you are in a position to do something about it and you feel correct about doing that, uh, then you should do it. Uh, somebody may have committed a crime uh, of which you are a victim then you take them through the process of law. Sometimes you are in a situation where the rule of law doesn't really work in the way that you um, think it should work. Uh, maybe there's corruption or something like this. Maybe people spend a lot of money for expensive lawyers. You don't have that kind of money. And so sometimes you just say, you have to cut your losses and move on but each situation must be evaluated. And if it's something, somebody did something bad to you, you need to stand up for yourself. It's a good idea to uh, stand up for yourself and um, you know, get them to back down or to apologize or to do some kind of restitution, but every situation must be seen in its own merits and you have to see what you can do and what you should do and what you will do and you decide and then you do. Sister, we are getting some comments on YouTube saying that um, I have lots of karma from the past with myself and two daughters. The knowledge and divine is helping. Could I please contact for more help as much more to face? The other one is, Sister Denise, how could I be able to contact you for learning and growing my spiritual practices, etc.? <laughs> well, I am not really in a position to uh, take on individual things like this, but there are many people like me in the centers who can be very helpful for you. Where is your, your local center? And, um, you know, I, I have done on, on my YouTube channel tons and tons of... Uh, interviews and classes and sessions and so on. So if you go on YouTube and you look at uh, just Denise Lawrence, you will find about 500 videos on that um, and uh, meditations. And so, you know, I'm just one person, right? And so you can only do so much. So I try to um, um, share what I've learned because I have learned a great deal. I've studied this for a long time and the best that I can do is to try to share it. And then if you um, can really take advantage of that, uh, then that's, that's great, you know, uh, but I'm not in a position to sort of take on people. Um, my plate is very full. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I have endless questions. The questions are still coming through, but I think we will have to probably send it to you by email. And if you could send me the reply so that I could forward it to the concerning people. I think it might be better if we could give ourselves another five minutes. I think it'd be more expedient for me to try and take them up now than... Uh then deal with uh, uh, an email answer. Is okay. Like okay, so I go on with it, yeah? I think so, yeah. Okay. Acceptance of destiny diminishes our role in changing circumstances. Can destiny be changed? If not, then we are in a predetermined compulsion, isn't it? <laughs> not necessarily. Well, um, Destiny cannot be changed, but you don't know what it is until it's already happened. So there's that. Um, we have to have a relationship with circumstances. And in the 12-step um, uh, program of Alcoholics Anonymous, there is something called the Serenity Prayer. And I can never remember it exactly, but it goes to the effect that you want from God the strength to change the things you can 
and the um, courage to accept the things you can't change and the wisdom to know the difference. And that I think is really a very important um, a piece of uh, poetry. And so you have to see what you can do and face what's there. And sometimes acceptance is the right thing. Arriving at a, a state of acceptance is very good. Uh, because when you've accepted what's happened and there's nothing you can do about it, then you have to move on because life goes on and things happen and it's okay. Remember that you are a pure, peaceful, powerful, loveful, blissful being of light and all of these things what have happened and are happening, it's all in the game and the game game of victory and defeat and so we have to deal with it yeah we have a comment here saying that sister denise is sitting in a very beautiful room so she definitely has done good karmas <laughs> well this is um, uh, another person's place and so i'm sitting here for today <laughs> but uh, yeah there are beautiful places in this world where we can sit, but they're not ours, you know. True. Um, we have two interesting questions. Will our negative karmas not be nullified through meditation? And how do I know that my karmas are getting nullified through regular meditation? Well, sometimes people don't quite understand this. I think there's somebody who's trying to speak, but you need to close your mic while I'm answering the question. I'm not sure who that is. Um, okay, basically, um, when you meditate, you are connecting yourself with the Supreme Being and you are taking power. And that power that you're taking takes the form of the ability to manage the different consequences of your karma such that they are manageable and you neutralize them. Uh, you get through the suffering of karma with ease when you have the good power of meditation, but you cannot imagine that just by sitting and meditating is gonna make your karma mir miraculously go away. No, it will come, but you are uh, using your meditation to get the strength and the wisdom to handle it and move on. That is how it finishes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, sister. Thank you for all the time you have given us. You have gone beyond time and tried to answer all the questions. And I think, um, as you said, maybe we could have one more session on karmic accounts, because that will give more clarity and more depth. Yes, yes, that's a good idea, because, I mean, this is the period of settlement of karma. It is said to be that period. So everything is coming down on you like mountains falling on your head. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever you are able to do it, we will set up the time and we will create another session based on that topic. So okay. thank you once again. Thank you for joining us. And we will have another session on Saturday, the 27th of February. I have dropped my number on the chat box. Do feel free to message me if you have any questions for Sister Denise you can always message me and I will forward them to her. Also, if you would like to know for the upcoming sessions, I can update you if you drop me a message. I don't have your contact. So kindly drop me a message so that I can get in touch with you. Until then, stay safe, stay blessed. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, Sister Denise. Thank you. And Om, Om Shanti. Shanti. Thank mm -hmm. you.